Hi, and welcome to Mental Matters on Open Studio. My name is Frank Malaba, and today I'm speaking to Craig Woodhouse and Genevieve Burrow. So uh, today we're talking about uh, bipolar. It's wonderful to have you two in studio. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for having me too. Uh, Craig, could you tell me a little bit about what bipolar is? What does it mean when somebody says I'm bipolar? Are there different variations? Yeah, so it? it's essentially classified as a mood disorder. Um, periods of extreme highs and extreme lows, um, what we call depression and mania. Um, just kind of different levels of bipolar. Um, some, some bipolars are more depressive than manic and some are more manic than depressive. It's probably the easiest way to put it. Okay. Um, yeah. And Genevieve, how did it happen that you came to be diagnosed? Did you always know that something was going on? Absolutely not. I come from a long line of very depressed people in my family and um, I felt like I was always the anomaly. I felt like I had escaped that gene. Um, but 10 years ago my mom committed suicide and that triggered my bipolar disorder. So after a year and a half I was misdiagnosed with PTSD and I went to see a psychiatrist and he diagnosed me with bipolar disorder. Mm. So it was genetic, but it was triggered by my mother's death. So if I'm getting you right, it's possible that some people have a form of bipolar that's not genetic and some people have a form of, of bipolar that is not hereditary, is it? Correct. I was genetically predisposed to the bipolar gene. However, it was triggered. It became active. So it was a latent dormant gene ah. and it became active with my mother's suicide. So that was when it catalyzed all of the symptoms and I was eventually diagnosed. Okay. Uh, remember um, that at, if at any time uh, you feel you'd like to talk to somebody uh, regarding suicide, uh, we are mentioning uh, a few things that might come as a trigger to some people that are watching at home, we've got a number uh, that you can call that's on your screen right now. Uh, please call that number and talk to somebody who can assist you or if you know somebody uh, that is going through a suicidal uh, moment or if is feeling suicidal, that's also the number to call. Craig, uh, tell me about what life has been like for you since your diagnosis. Since my diagnosis, uh, it's improved uh, dramatically. Um, and the, really the diagnosis came of me thinking that this is possibly what I had, did some reading, seemed to check all the, all the tick boxes mm -hmm. um, and then was really working with a psychiatrist. So once I started taking meds, I realised I was starting to behave in a more normal manner mm. because my behaviour in the past had got me into a lot of hot water. <laughs> it, what, it was, what was that like? What, what, what was so your behaviour? So that was what, it's really in interpersonal relationships okay. is, is where it's difficult because my mood's not really in line with the situation. So I'm behaving in a way that's not similar to everybody else. Okay. So especially in the workplace, for example, if there's no pressure, but I'm behaving like someone who's under a lot of pressure, it seems a bit off and a bit weird. Um, so it means people are more wary of, of being around me. Um, but being on meds, that's become a lot easier because now my mood is more situational because the meds are controlling my mood. Mm, all right. Has it been the same for you, Genevieve? My experience since my diagnosis has been quite positive. I knew preceding the diagnosis, I knew I had bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. um, my sister had bipolar too, so I recognized the symptoms. Since my diagnosis, when my psychiatrist diagnosed me, I fell apart a little bit in that I attached a great deal of self-stigma. I, I didn't see that stigma from people around me. Mm -hmm. My husband, my, fr my friends, my family were all incredibly supportive, but it was what I'd seen in the mass media, newspaper headlines, schizophrenic man does this, bipolar man does that. And I assumed that I would go, go down that path. It was sort of indoctrination of, mm. of these, um, everything I saw in society about bipolar disorder, all of the negatives, there was nothing positive that was being reported. So I attached that self-stigma. So the hardest part for me was to free myself of that. But medication definitely worked and psychology as well, seeing a therapist. And I have a very holistic approach to treating my bipolar, which mm. consists of medication, psychology, and my work. 
I work for the Psychological Society of South Africa's student division, and that fulfills me. It gives me uh, a great deal of joy and pleasure because I study psychology and I work in psychology and educating the public, educating students. That for me is an ongoing part of my healing process. Mm. Because I've it must be quite uh, precious to be able to understand what what's going on in one's body and being able to kind of uh, get all the moving parts and say, okay, when this happens, this is yes. going on, and to understand that. Because a lot of people don't get that experience with dealing with their with with their condition? Absolutely. I'm an avid Googler, so I Google absolutely everything regardless of what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, and upon my diagnosis, although I was already familiar with, with mental health and mental challenges that I'd seen in my family, I did a great deal of research, so I Googled everything. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a psychiatrist and a psychologist. However, my psychology studies have given me an academic perspective. So now I know if I'm heading towards a depressive episode, I know exactly what's going on in my body. I know if I'm becoming anxiety, uh, anxious and I can sense an anxiety attack. I, I tell myself, it's your autonomic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous <laughs> system. Uh, so I have all of that academic knowledge. I'm not quite sure if, if it's to my benefit because I sort of look at myself oh, as man. a patient. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, later on, we're gonna go into a little bit of that. We, we, we call them life hacks or superpowers. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that uh, later on. And Craig, uh, can you tell me about, um, about what it has been like for you in the workplace since diagnosis in terms, you touch a little bit on it. Yeah. I just wanna say, has, has that affected the, the workplace more in the way that the workplace interacts with you? Not so much you outwardly interacting with the workplace, but you know, it's always a transference, right? For, for a long time, the, the difficulty is for a long time, I didn't want to mention uh -huh. that I had bipolar disorder, even though I was being medicated. Mm -hmm. um, but when it flares up and you haven't told anyone, it, it's given many different reasons. And you put on review very quickly because the behavior's going out and it gets blamed on, on other things. Mm -hmm. um, so I made a decision fairly recently to, to stop doing that. And I think it's very important for us who suffer from bipolar to get it out there that we have it it's not a be all end all the gifts that come with it mm -hmm. um, that are very valuable in the workplace. But just some more understanding on maybe sick leave, um, why, that's, why that's, we're not physically sick, I don't have the flu, but I can't work today. Um, and I think if we can get that message out there, that would be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. It would be really good. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, we will be still talking to Craig and Genevieve about bipolar. So we'll see you on the other side after this. Welcome back to Mental Matters on Open Studios. Today I'm speaking to Craig and Genevieve. We're talking about bipolar. I'm Frank Malaba. <laughs> so Genevieve, bipolar is not something that people easily want to go into and say, uh, I have it, mm -hmm. and to just openly talk about it. Mm -hmm. What are the stigmas that you have faced uh, when you have spoken or when you've heard other people talk about it? greatest stigma I faced is self-stigma, uh, which was 100% self-imposed based on what I'd seen in the media and other people. It took me a long time to realize that as an individual, I have control and power over my mental health and my physical health, and that mental health is health and health is mental health. Mm. Once I started accepting that within myself, my, per my perspective changed. However, about six months after my diagnosis, I was at a birthday party and someone was relaying a story about her crazy, unstable ex. And very long story and um, she ended it with, but he was bipolar so that all makes sense. You know, bipolar people are crazy. Whoa. So I said to her, well, uh, <laughs> and she also said they're not to be trusted. So I said, well, would you trust me? Uh, do I look crazy? And she said, no. So I said, well, I have bipolar and her face, <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> But I've, I've heard stories like that. I definitely have heard stories. To my knowledge, I haven't been faced with stigma from people. Mm. Uh, definitely though, we don't discuss it, we don't talk about it. It's still taboo and it's still shameful. Mm. And that's the public and societal perception. Mm. Um, and definitely, I think a lot of the stigma has to do with normalizing mental health 
and we criminalize it, we demonize, we demonize it, we persecute people in the workplace once we normalize it and actively work towards that. Mm. I think the self-stigma and the societal stigma, that mind shift will change. Craig, what's been your experience with stigma? Stigma, I really, I think it's more along the lines, that there's a lot of similarities to what Jenny okay. was saying. But I think the extra to that is, I've, I don't know if I'm correct about this, but it seems in some way people are scared they can catch it. Uh, <laughs> so just by being so close to someone with a mental illness, I think that's the whole spectrum of mental illness. In some way it's catching. You know, sometimes I feel really sad, so that I have bipolar, I don't want to hear anything, in case I do. Uh, maybe it's, it's kind of some, somewhere along the lines of that. Um, but then in the workplace it's, it's quite a big problem. Mm. Because am I, am I going to employ someone who's going to be off a lot, or behave poorly? or whatever kind of stigma they've developed from hearing this, uh, the way the media portrays it, even movies. Yes. Uh, and even though we know they're fictional, oh, we yes. still take this as, as a reality. Um, but there are a lot of very, very successful people with bipolar disorder, and there have been, um, from great scientists to amazing actors to musicians and all sorts. Last week, uh, last week what happened with me uh, after having started this show, I arrived at work and um, in conversation. So, what did you do yesterday? Oh, um, we, 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 we were um, in a TV show that uh, that I host. Uh, we talk about mental health issues. What are you doing there? Mm. And just that disbelief that yeah. somebody like me could be um, a, a person that suffers from mental illness was just something unfathomable to this person. Yes. And I didn't feel a big hint of, of, of stigma that moment, but I could see how mm. it could easily be planted in one's mind. Because I was well-rounded and I'm great at what I do, um, you know, in the workplace. But suddenly there was this thing dangling over. It's like, you, you, can't, you can't be like that. And so I'd like you people at home to know that um, people that have bipolar disorder or any other mental illness are people that are functional, fully functional, fully employable, and they do show up and a lot of them are quite efficient at what they do. <laughs> I'm fortunate in my work with the Psychological Society of South Africa Student Division because I'm surrounded by psychology students and psychology professionals. So for me, it's quite commonplace and, and quite, quite normalized. Uh, but in previous jobs, I have been scared and nervous to admit it. Um, and I did tell one colleague and she said, oh, that's why you're so bubbly. <laughs> and I, when I actually went on medication, I said to my husband, I said, but I'm, I, I know I'm quite an effervescent, positive, optimistic person. What if I go on meds and all of that changes because it's the bipolar? But that's, as Craig said, it's what we see on TV and in the media and, and, and in movies. And also, do you think that was an internalized uh, kind of stigma that was going on there? Absolutely. A hundred percent internalized uh, because of what I'd seen. And when I heard things like, oh, that's why you're usually in such a good mood, or, oh, you were sad the other day, now it makes sense. And I'm like, no, my cat died. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not There's the bipolar. That. So I think people do attach this, um, your behavior must be described as this or that. And mm. I've also told people I have bipolar disorder and they don't believe me mm -hmm. because I'm a very stable and consistent, highly functioning person. And it's, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous mm. to see how in this day and age, there still isn't this understanding that we are normal people. I mean, no one's normal. There's no such thing. Normal yeah. is a range and not a point. But bipolar disorder doesn't mean that you're unemployable. It doesn't mean that you're, you're not to be trusted. Exactly. You're unreliable uh, whatsoever. And unfortunately, that is prevalent. Uh, Craig, you mentioned movies. TVs, media, uh, portraying it in a negative, in a negative. What was your first experience with that? The moment that you're sitting there and you're watching, like, oh, this is not right. But what, what's that feeling? Was it before or after diagnosis? Yeah, I think it, I think it's more of using a, a mental disorder as a reason, mm -hmm. use it or an excuse even for behaviour, and uh, it's not it's not how things work um, because. Otherwise, what if normal people, let's say normal people, <laughs> that word. could be serial killers? <laughs> yes. yes. So then now we, so you're normal, so people are going to worry, can I be a serial killer? If you attribute some disorder towards that, then okay, it's only those, those people. 
the amount the amount of times I've seen on the crime channel or a similar type of channel um, on different platforms how a serial killer is described as mm. you, you can't just mm. they can't just be bad people yes it's got to be attached to something so there, there's got to be like a, a whole mental illness attached to it there's got to be this thing that made them do it because clearly it couldn't have just been having a bad day yeah. we've got to uh, find a reason and that's what people love to do there's got to be a bigger reason behind this people love to blame things however when you see on the crime channel that someone has not been diagnosed with a mental illness the headline isn't mentally stable person <laughs> kills, exactly. <laughs> kills family exactly. but when a bipolar person does it or anyone with mental health challenges that's included in the headline there we go so we go. why why do we do that because we're looking for a reason a scapegoat can we Absolutely. come back to that uh, right after this we shall be back on the other side with Genevieve and Craig Welcome back to Mental Matters on Open Studio. I'm talking to Craig and Genevieve today. We're talking about bipolar. A lot of things have come up um, earlier, which I've learned from and which I'm sure that you're learning from at, at home. But I uh, just wanted to point out that uh, with some of the things that we've talked about today, um, things like suicide or anything that you might find triggering, there is a number that uh, is going on on your screen where you can actually uh, call talk to somebody and uh, they'll assist you and you can get help or if you know somebody that's going through uh, suicide or any triggers that you might you think they might want to talk to somebody about that's the number to call and also you can contact us uh, through our Facebook page which is also going on your screen now and I think will be shown uh, later on in the program as well as contacting us via email you can get us on mental matters courage at gmail.com. That's also on your screen. Mental Matters Courage at gmail.com. So, this is an exciting part of our show where we talk about your life hacks or your superpower. <laughs> um, so, as a result of being bipolar, um, there are other things that I, I guess you've noticed that uh, give you um, a certain uh, courage, a certain thing that you do very well that's more pronounced. What is that for you, Genevieve? I think it's made me a better student. <laughs> okay. I definitely think so. I have always been a hard worker, but it, it's definitely inspired me to also have more routine and more structure in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in terms of studying, it's made me, it's, it's, it's ultimately what led me to study psychology and to put me on, on this path. So it's motivated me to get into, I mean, I was in IT, I was in marketing. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different field and it motivated me to do this, to become involved with SISA Student Vision and to be able to reach people, to really have that passion. Mm -hmm. For um, being able to pay it forward, so it's it's helped me in that regard. And uh, my kitchen cupboard is my grocery cupboard is permanently uh, really well organized. So That's there's exactly. there's that too. I'll I'll need some tips from you for that because mine's a mess. <laughs> Craig, <laughs> what is what has what is your your life hack that has come through, or even your superpower? Yeah, sure. Take a pick. No, I can go <laughs> invisible when I want. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> there was, uh, we've got quite a sizable Facebook group for, okay. for South African sufferers of bipolar disorder. And every now and again, we run a few polls. And we did one on, on kind of superpowers and life hacks. And the top answer was, was actually surprising, but now I think about it, not at all. Um, that it was problem solving and pattern recognition. Now, it sounds weird, but if you think about it, that's, that's a logic side of the brain and a creative side of the brain. Mm. And the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, in, in my life, I've, I've, I am very creative musically, but logically I understand music and can read it and have the skill to play the instrument. And that wow. came, so I really think there's something in this. And I think if we did you know, a more solid uh, study, we might find that maybe bipolar people have this way of thinking that both the logic side and the creative side work at the same time which mm. I think is phenomenally uh, valuable in work, um, in relationships, for, for the creative world, for, for everything, because we are able to access both sides of those brains at once. Mm. So, so I think a lot of us are all-rounders. I don't know if you'd agree with that, too. 
Definitely, and I think also it, it brings a certain empathy and compassion into into my life, and and definitely speaking to you and the yeah. people around me is we we become more aware and cognizant of what other people are going through, sure. and more accepting of that. But you mentioned your Facebook group, and I yeah. think that's wonderful to be able to reach out to people mm. and to give them that platform. But also, yes, problem solving and strategies. Definitely, I definitely yeah. agree. With with that. Um, <clears throat> let's say you're in a zone and you feel um, that you're, you're you're going on a down. What's the sort of thing that you do to pep yourself up? Uh, that's that's not medication. What is it that you work on? Uh, I, I, I'd like to stand corrected, and yes. I'd like you to correct me as well. Uh, from what I, I understood, there there are times where you either go up or correct. where you go down. So is there a life hack? Is there a negative side to being on an upper? Absolutely. Because, I mean, uh, aren't risky, we all striving to be to Risky be behavior. No, it's, yeah. it's more than that. Yeah. It's not being happy. It's being so overexcitedly happy yes. that you think you can do everything. You, money goes out the window because you think you're a billionaire. Um, you drive to Timbuktu just because. Um, it's, it's quite, it's the crazy side of our disorder, if ah. you're going to call it crazy. Mm. Um, it's, it's not great, and we don't tend to see ourselves going that way because it's good to feel good. So you have other people that can point it out and this say, is hey. why This is why a support structure is so vital. Because even on the depressive moments, and you understand depression, it's very difficult to, to do anything. On the manic side, we're doing everything <laughs> and more, yeah. um, and it becomes destructive. Oh. That's the thing. So while depression is only really destructive to ourselves, maybe, uh, manic is destructive to anyone around us. Yeah. Um, so, so just to keep that in check, and that's why the medication is so valuable, and we're also having that support structure where mm. we can have people come and say, listen, I see where you're going. You don't necessarily see it. It's good for them to tell us. We can now we are aware and then put some measures in place. Is that easy to take on board if you're on, a, if you're on an upper? I think somebody it, comes and says, I think maybe you learn that with in. experience. Mm. Experience can teach you where this goes if you don't. Mm -hmm. Like anything in life, if... If we haven't learned where it goes, if, we, if we're if we not listening, then we choose to start listening, and that's mm. important. So I listen, um, and I hope that people out there are aware that this is happening. And people will be telling them, hey, you're behaving like this, and maybe they'll look at themselves and say, oh, wait a minute, mm. I'm seeing something here. I, think, that's I think even if somebody hates it when you tell them something, in that moment, they'll, they'll probably explode and go crazy. But when they're alone, Yes. There is that moment of recognition of, oh, I think John was right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Plant I'm, the seed at least. <laughs> I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to get time to, to think about it. And when you're alone with your thoughts, you think, people tell me things because they care. They're not just doing it to, to yes. get me you know, uh, under their spell or whatever they want to do with me. The thing with the mania is that one feels slightly detached. So mm. I, I have had fortunately only experienced one very severe mania and I was aware of what was happening because I had seen it in other people around me. But it's not fun. It's, mm. it's not this, oh, I have so much energy, I'm so hyperproductive. It's a terrible feeling because you are so out of control. Mm. It's not pleasant. And I think being able to identify the triggers and to be able to identify the symptoms and your behavior. And a friend of mine, I said to a friend of mine, I don't know what's wrong with me, and this is happening to me. And she said, you realize you have bipolar and it's time to go back to your psychiatrist. Yeah. So that put me in place for sure. And so being surrounded yes. by people that can help you yes. get on, on board with yourself helps a lot. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Thank you very much, Craig. It's been wonderful talking to you about bipolar disorder. So. At home, uh, we've been talking about bipolar disorder. We've talked about the life hacks that people have, the superpowers that they have. And also, uh, most importantly, we also encourage that if anything on the show has triggered something or you yourself are going through depression, uh, bipolar, suicide, or any of the mental illnesses that we talk about on this show, you can actually call the number that's on your screen right now. And for this week, I'd like to say thank you very much. It's been wonderful being with you, and we'll see you next time.